Good morning. When people think of things that are quintessentially British, I think they sometimes have these sorts of images in mind. Landmark buildings, iconic designs, uh, the royal family and uh, the patron saint, St George, typical British foods, and the sports stars who go out and uh, bring home our gold medals. These things are, of course, completely British. They couldn't be more British. But all of those images that you've seen share another thing in common. They all have their origins in other countries. I think there is something that is missing in Britain's cultural landscape. And that is a mainstream public institution that reflects the really important role that migration has always played in our national story. And I think it's really important that we should have such an institution to help us better understand what our attitudes are towards migration, because this is something that really matters. Migration is uh, a hot political topic, and it's, uh, it couldn't really be a more topical issue. It's a front-page news story virtually every day. And if there isn't a story about worries about too many immigrants coming into the country or about the global migrant and refugee crisis, there are stories all the time about Britishness and belonging, about who we are, about identity and inclusion. And I think these are things that people talk about day in, day out. They're constant preoccupations. Some people know what they think about migration. Uh, they're clear and set in their ideas. So about 25% of people at either end of the political spectrum hold broadly pro- or anti-immigration views that they're not likely to change. But the biggest proportion of people, the 50% in the middle, have much more complicated views than that. And they're often internally contradictory. So those people might feel, for example, that too much immigration causes congestion in public services. And they might have a point. They might be right about that. On the other hand, they know perfectly well that the doctor, who they sometimes find it so difficult to find an appointment with, is someone who was born abroad, maybe born in India. And I think people genuinely wrestle with these kinds of questions. They find it difficult to work out what their attitudes really are, and they weigh these things up on a daily basis. But there is more to British migration than simply being a set of issues or a set of problems to be resolved. Underlying it, there is a story, a highly relevant, long story of migration, both to and from Britain, and it goes back hundreds of years. It's a story that isn't particularly well known, and it's still waiting to be told. People often think that immigration is something that's really only happened recently, only since the Second World War. Uh, and, of course, the scale and pace of immigration has changed a lot in recent decades. But actually, its roots go back way further than that. So the Angles and the Saxons were immigrants, so were the Vikings, so were the Normans, so were the medieval Italian bankers and the Flemish weavers, so were the Irish who dug the canals, and so were the innovators and the uh, thinkers who came to Britain from all over the world during the Industrial Revolution. These people were all immigrants in the same way that people who come to this country today are immigrants from Syria or Eritrea or Germany or Poland. Britain's migration story isn't always straightforward. It's sometimes very complicated. It's pretty complicated right now. But even back in the Middle Ages, it was complicated. There was a sizable Jewish population. And they were the people who financed, largely, the capital projects of the day. The cathedrals and the castles built by Normans, <coughs> financed by Jews, these are the things that, were put, uh, that uh, are the icons, now the icons of England. These are the things that appear on the front of our tourist brochures. That Jewish population famously was harried out of the country and was expelled in 1290. And nor is it a story about which it's easy to make simple generalisations. Look at a group like the Huguenots, a large immigration of 50,000 or so who came here at the end of the 17th century. They were refugees, réfugiés. They gave us the word for refugees from, from Catholic France. A hugely diverse group. They came from all strata of French society. Some of them were huge successes when they settled here. So the first governor of the Bank of England, John Huguenot, he was a Huguenot. Some of them were criminals. Most of them were just ordinary people getting on with their lives. Uh, some of them didn't integrate in ways that we would consider uh, to be desirable today. They spoke French for several generations. But in the end, this large, diverse, complicated group settled down and found its way within the fabric of British society. And the next slide shows this point. And I'm showing you this partly because it's local. Um, you may have passed this hundreds of times if you live anywhere close to, to here. It's the crest of Wandsworth Borough Council, and it's on the outside of the town hall. There's a checkerboard there, and inside each of the squares of the checkerboard, there's a drop 
and those represent the tears of the Huguenots who settled in Wandsworth in large numbers. Britain's migration story isn't just about income as either, it's very much about people leaving the country too. So during the time, I think this is perhaps a bit of the story that's, uh, that's less well known, during the time of the rise and fall of the British Empire between about 1650 and 1950, something like 20 million Britons went to live abroad. So that is a vast, mainly economic migration, unmatched by any other country in the world. And right up until 1982, Britain was a net exporter of people. So there is a big picture here. There's no simple narrative, and still less are there any simplistic messages to take away. But what you do have is a rich and complex pageant of individual episodes of people coming to and going from British shores, and it goes back for hundreds of years. So why should we want to represent this story in a cultural institution? Why not just talk about it in a textbook or discuss it in a think tank? Well, I think the world of culture is where we test our ideas and uh, interrogate our attitudes. And if people are worried about the way that British culture is affected by migration, then a cultural institution is a really good place to start investigating that particular issue. And a cultural institution that you can visit is a good and trusted place, like a museum, where you can exchange ideas, exchange stories, and begin to see the world through other people's eyes. And I think we could do two things with such an institution. We could create something that is really, truly popular, with something in it for absolutely everybody. Because if you peel back the layers of anybody's family history, you will find a migration story. And if it isn't a story of coming into the country at some point in the past, there'll be a story of emigration somewhere in the past. People like to do this kind of thing. They like to unravel their past, and they like to find surprising connections. And this is something which joins people up. It joins people up both with each other and also with the panorama, with the big picture. And the second thing we can do is to provide a space where people can interrogate their attitudes and think about how they feel about migration, away from newspapers and away from politics, where the arguments can be crude and they can be shrill. And in an atmosphere of calm and authority, they can consider how they feel about the issues that they think and, and, and worry about, I think, on a daily basis. And in that way, I think we can contribute to a more reasoned public conversation about migration. So if there's to be something in this for absolutely everybody, then it's right that absolutely everybody should be able to contribute to this. And we've started collecting stories of migration, and I'm just going to share three of those with you today. So the first one comes from George Allagaya. He's extremely well known. He reads the news. He's a journalist and broadcaster. Uh, his family were Tamils from Sri Lanka, and they moved first of all to Ghana, and then they came to Britain. And that, this is him standing with his sisters and his mother. Uh, and it's the kind of photograph. It's not intended for a public audience. It's a, it's a private family photograph. And it was the kind of image that they would send home back to their relatives in Sri Lanka. And he said, they sta stand in front of the family car because it's a kind of shorthand to, to, to illustrate sort of how, how they were prospering. The second image is from someone called Lily Abbott, and she's a Holocaust survivor. She's holding up a little pendant. She was transported with her family from Hungary, where she lived, to Auschwitz. And her mother concealed this little piece of jewellery in the heel of her shoe. For reasons Lily now can't remember, she and her mother swapped shoes on the way. And when they got to Auschwitz, Lily's mother was taken to the gas chambers. Lily remarkably survived, along with some other members of her family. And perhaps more remarkably still, she also managed to hold on to that little bit of jewellery. She kept it hidden in her shoes and she kept it hid it in pieces of bread. As far as she's aware, it's the only piece of jewellery known to have gone into and come out of Auschwitz with its owner. And when this image was shown at an exhibition recently, Lily herself came along and she told us this story. And it was a remarkable and moving thing to hear this diminutive octogenarian with a strong Hungarian accent. She sounded as if she'd been living in this country for some months rather than 50 or 60 years, with a big heart. And she told this young audience, it was a young Hackney audience, she told them what it was like in Auschwitz. And the third image comes from someone called Paul Evans. He visited the jungle refugee camp in Calais at the end of last year. And he went not because he was particularly interested in the refugee situation or particularly sympathetic, in fact. He went because his daughter needed help and she was someone who, she's a paramedic, she hands out uh, vaccinations there and she needed help with rebuilding the, the, the shelter uh, from which they uh, dished out these, these, these vaccinations. And while he was there, he saw this. 
And this is a man, uh, there was a fire that raged through the camp, uh, an accidental fire. And this man is contemplating uh, what was his tent. He's lost everything. He's lost all his worldly possessions. And it's absolutely freezing cold, and there's a, there's a howling wind. And out of nowhere, there comes a woman with this red carpet. The image is called the red carpet, and she lays it over his shoulders to keep him warm, and she just goes away again. And the person who took this photograph was profoundly moved by this simple act of humanity. Uh, and he says that his attitudes, really, towards the situation were entirely affected by having witnessed this and also by what he saw when he was, uh, when he was in, in Calais. So these images, I think, unlock really powerful stories. And I believe that we all have some sort of image like this that speaks of our own history of migration or of our own identity. And the stories behind these images contain the humanity, which is something which connects us up with each other. There's plenty of research that shows, and this is entirely unsurprising, I think, that contact between people and between individuals promotes greater understanding. And this is borne out because when you ask people whether they think that immigration is a problem nationally, 70 to 80 percent of people think that it is. But when you ask those same people whether they think that immigration is a problem in their local area, that figure falls to 20 to 30 percent. So that is powerful evidence that if you bring things home, if you make what is otherwise strange familiar, you promote greater tolerance and greater understanding and greater respect. Understanding our attitudes towards migration really matters. This is something important. It's too important to be left to the politicians and the newspapers. It is high time that we had in this country a migration museum for Britain where images and stories like this can be shared. It is high time that we had an institution that put Britain's migration story right at centre stage, where it belongs, at the heart of the national consciousness. Thank you very much. Thank you.